the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story. And this is my backstory with Josh Boyer. Oh, man. We're live. I'm, uh, we're not live. We're live recording. I'm, uh, I'm here with, uh, Bearheart Saputo. Did I say that right? Yeah. All right. Medicine man, somebody that I had the privilege of uh, sitting with in ceremony last uh, November, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, we're actually world famous, if you think about it, because we're on <laughs> H- <laughs> HBO Sports, <laughs> Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. Um, super funny the way that all turned out. Um, I was in a place in my life where I was really struggling, you know, and uh, and I got in contact with Jesse from uh, Heroic Hearts, and... He's like, hey, you cool with uh, being on HBO uh, Real Sports with Brian Gumbel? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, there's going to be cameras there and stuff like that. And as it turned out, it actually was a very strange experience for me, man. Like, with all the cameras everywhere. And I imagine, like, you being in that work probably uh, was very strange for you, too. <laughs> the first and only time I've ever allowed any type of vid- video yeah. and audio to be taken in a space like that, in a sacred sp- in a container. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, dude, like with all the things and the things and the lights and everything, it was completely different. But it was uh, an opportunity for me to really give like to to release any type of control that I felt like I, I needed to keep the plant safe or to keep the brothers that were there attending in a in a safe, truly safe container. But because the expectation was to come to sit with medicine and for it to be broadcasted to try to help other people. Yep. And that was where, like, if there was any type of control that I was holding on to, I just needed to release it. Because if there, I, I, I was told the Caliber brothers that were coming, and I know that we all live very similar lives. Yep. And so if... If that's who's going to be there, then there's going to be a resonating factor of the people that are listening and watching. And so if that ceremony would help one other person know that they can come and do work in a different way and actually get some really deep, deep, deep help with yeah. it, then it was worth it. Absolutely, man. I um, I think, I, I know for me personally, it was a, uh, a profound um, experience because it's, it opened the door for me to go down other avenues as well. And it led to you and I being connected, which is totally awesome. And I think, uh, you know, like I told you, like us doing this podcast was like right on time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like you reaching out was like right on time. I just moved out uh, to Texas from California. I mean, I used to live here as a kid. So like being where we are right now, like is, is kind of my old stomping grounds. Um, but yeah, it's just powerful that we're, we're back in, the, in a room together, like uh, getting the opportunity to podcast. And so I want this show not to be um, so much about my own experience with with the, with the medicine and stuff like that. I want it to be about your life. Like, what got you to being Bearheart Saputo? You know, what got you to being where you are today in the work that you're doing um, now? I mean, what was your life like? I want the, the the floor is yours. I want you to share your your story authentically from the very beginning, as far back as you want to go. Um, and uh, as always with all of my guests, there's no judgment whatsoever. So anything that we talk about... Um, there's no judgment. And I, and I know that most of the listeners, if not all of them, suspend judgment when they listen to the guests. And I, you know, believe it or not, man, you see people that share some of the most crazy stories about their lives. And those are the ones that you get the most feedback on mm. in a positive way where people are like, man, I can totally relate. Thank you for sharing that because now it gives me the freedom to share my, my truth. Mm. Um, so I want you to share your story with, uh, with the audience and, uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, brother. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. What got me to be Bearheart? You know, the thing is, energetically, I've always been Bearheart. I was given many different nicknames in my life. I earned many different nicknames in my life that one way or another, um, it all was the same vibration. And that is, uh, you know, when we think of a bear, some people can look at it in different ways. But what I look at a bear is, is an, uh, it's a being that has 
an immense amount of energy, but utilizes it in, a, in the most healthy way within the ecosystem. Yep. You know, a bear can tear apart any other animal in the ecosystem, but it eats berries the majority of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And and I've been around in the bush. I've been around lots of bears, black bears and grizzly bears and so on and so forth. And it is a very, very, very powerful animal, but it's also the protector animal as well. Right. And then when you throw in the heart, I've always had heart. I've always had heart in every which way, shape and form you could possibly think about it. But the bear heart actually didn't come through until I was willing to forgive and willing to be very compassionate with other people's hearts. Right. And so if you were my family, if you were my blood, I was raised to give you my full heart. If you were not my blood, then you were to be manipulated. Right. Because in this world, I was taught by my father, by my grandfathers, that somebody's always going to do something to manipulate you and or our family in one way or another. And so we get to know how to combat that. Right. Um, you know, my story, my story starts off, I think quite similar to many others in that early uh, childhood, there were different confusing situations that came through. The most confusing for me as a child was, uh, having a father that uh, he, he cooked methamphetamine. And again, when I speak of my story, I want whoever's going to be listening right off the bat to know that. I, I don't look at myself as a victim, nor ever have. It just, it wasn't until I started having children myself to understand how some of this shit was just really fucked up. Yeah. And, um, and so my father was a meth cook and a very sensitive man, a very loving man, a man that every woman wanted to be with, every man wanted to be like. He was a man, if from the outside, he was a man of honor, he was a man of integrity. He was a dancer. He was a sculptor. He was an artist. He was a martial artist. He, you know, like somebody that no matter who you were and because he gave you his, like his every bit of his presence, you felt like you were in front of a, like God figure. So that was my role model. Thing was, is that when I was between three or four, he went to prison for cooking and child endangerment, so on and so forth. When you have a lab inside the house, there's all different stuff that yeah. You know, they tack on with that. And, um, you know, he left when I was one years old. So that was the, that was the, the child wound for me with my father was he had always said he only continued to have children just to have his son. And then now the son came, he named me after him. And then on my first birthday, he left my mother and he went and he basically raised a whole nother family about five miles away. Oh, wow. And so the youngest memories for me and with my father was he just came out of prison. He was huge, like huge, big old beard. And he idolized his experience within prison. The thing was that even as a little boy, I could tell that something happened to him when he was in the pen, whether or not something was taken from him or his pride was taken or however that went, he never talked about it, but it definitely created in him, the want, the need, and the desire to train his boys differently than what he was trained. Right. And so at five years old was really when everything started to kick in of the training. And that was essentially where my brother and I, if my cousin was around, he would be involved in it as well. But my brother on the desk and I, you know, again, my father was a man that Everyone wanted to be around, but he only gave his time and attention to very specific people and for very specific reasons. And for us, you, you didn't just get to hang out with dad. He wasn't a father that like sat down on the couch with you and watched movies. He definitely wasn't a father that came in the room and asked how you're doing and rubbed your head. It was like, boys, if you're going to come mess with me, if you're going to bring your energy around me, we're going to train. Yeah. And we're going to train for a specific reason. There was a code. And anything that we train for in life, the code is is not, mm, not being a predator to anything as far as like no, no women, no children, no innocence. But if you are a man and you're not innocent and you're a predator, this is who we're training for. Right. So from five to, you know, five to 10, 
there was a combination of like pain was first as little boys, you have to understand how to, how to go through pain. And so a lot of times when I speak of this, I always get, well, can you elaborate on what pain is? And for me as a little boy, again, I didn't think anything like when you're just a little puppy and you're wanting to do whatever dad, uh, tells you to do because it's it's what's going to make him happy it's what's going to give you affection it's what's going to give you the love that i was really looking for so when he's saying like you need to know what it feels like to get cut and he's cutting us with razor blades or he's putting out matches on us like lit matches or he's dripping hot candle wax all over our bodies and like literally we're five six seven years old yeah. eight years old beating us and what i mean beating is is that he would set it up to where he would be smacking the shit out of us and like hard, not closed fists, but open just, and we're tiny little boys. Yeah. Past the screaming, no dad, no, no. What are you doing? All the way until the animalistic <laughs> came out inside of us. Yeah. And that was when he would stop. So just like you would a puppy, and I, and, I, and I understand a lot of this because I've owned a dog training company for 15 years. It's the exact same thing that you would do when you're teaching attack training in a puppy. You would set up something that would create a little bit of confusion in the dog, a little bit of fear in the dog. And most of the time, the little puppies, they try to, uh, they, they try to move away. They try to flee. They don't know what to do. It's confusing until their instinct... <laughs> And then that's what scares the person. So my dad did it the exact same way with us. So he was just training like little pit bulls. And then that went into different heavier tactics of pain when we were getting a little bit older. That went into um, different wild animals that were coming around the house that we had to kill essentially with our bare hands. And he started off with us doing that with rats and with mice inside the garage. And then that turned into the skunk or that turned into the possum or that turned into whatever he can show us that you need to be able to go absolutely ruthless and, and really understand that animal instinct and be able to go from calm to animal in a split second. Right. If we're really going to be the protectors, if we're really going to be the ones that are going to help our mothers and our sisters when the predators are going to come, then we need to understand how to get, how to engage. Do you look at that now though? Like from where you stand now, do you look at it as abuse or do you look at it as like, you're thankful for it? You're thankful that it happened because it made you the man you are today. I've always thought about it as being thankful. Yeah. That that's the whole thing. But I, and it was until nine years ago when I had my first child that there was no way possible I could ever imagine inflicting that much pain on my children, yep. no matter what the mission was. Because this can be looked at, and for a lot of people, um, it's either looked at as, wow, you went through such crazy stuff and so on and so forth. Very few can see it sort of like how I see it. And it's like, well, yeah, but you were being trained. Yep. And just like little martial artists are being trained, but my father... When you're being trained in the dojo, when you're being trained in, in those arts, it's usually coming f like the majority of it is honor-based, integral-based. Right. My father had that, um, you're nothing but a punk-ass little bitch unless you go to prison. You will not be a man and you will not be a respected man unless you go through the streets, you go into prison, you stay in mainline, you don't protective custody up, and you get to walk out with your head up. And so he was prepping us for gang life. He was prepping us for drug life. He was prepping us for prison. And so that was the big difference. It wasn't like, hey, I went to prison and it's the worst thing possible and you're going to screw your life up. It's no, boys. You either go through the same way or you're, you're a sissy. But it, like when you're a little boy, you, that's everything inside of you is like, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my dad proud. Oh, Absolutely. So, so now this is the thing. If it wasn't exactly for the amount of training that I had with my dad and my uncles, because it just wasn't my father. If it wasn't for all that training at such an early age, I'd have been dead a long time ago, multiple times over. It was like he knew exactly what he was doing, but it killed him. 
because every time he would beat us senselessly or every time he would burn us a bunch or every time we would go through whatever the lesson was. And it didn't stop until it was enjoyed. So the pain only stopped when you could enjoy it. The lesson only stopped when you enjoyed it. And that's where he would break down. It's like everything inside of him knew he had to do it, but there was so much confusion of him actually doing it. His system would shut down. He would cry almost immediately. He would feel bad about it. And that was also sort of confusing for my system. Oh, yeah. Because my my brother and my cousin were much softer. So when we would be going through the lessons, they would like, they would just shut down at times. And the only way that we could, because he taught us to work as a, as a unit as well. Right. The only way that we would be able to progress in the unit is if somebody took the slack. I was always the one that took the slack. No matter what it was, it was, dad, I'm going to go a thousand times stronger than both of them together because I'm the one who feels that you left me because I wasn't good enough. And so at whatever age it was, if it was me being the only one that was allowed to be in the lab to see how it was all going, my brother and my cousin weren't. If it was me being the one that was going on the runs to sell to the bikers because I was the little boy that nobody would have ever thought, like I was the one that was used for all that. Right. And not only with my father and within that those organizations, but then within the different criminal organizations that I was a part of after the fact. Right. Because that's like that's where all the training got to actually like be put into use, not just on the streets. Can we go into that? Hey. Let's do it. Come on. What, <laughs> what, what kind of question you got? So like being with your dad and going through all that stuff, I mean, I think outsiders looking in would be like, you know, they'd probably be like, dude, that's fucking abusive, man. What the fuck? You know, that's crazy. Um, and it's funny because my brother and I have a similar experience with my stepfather where like, I I wouldn't say if you were to ask my brother, I think he would tell you he was abusive. He would say he's abusive. And, you know, and for me, I always looked at it as like, no, like he wasn't abusive. There was like ramifications for your actions. So like when you did something, you knew like what the ramifications were going to be. And I was always a kid that didn't give a fuck. So it'd be like, all right, well, I know I'm going to get beat if I do whatever it is you're, you're telling me not to do. But for me, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And I'll take the beating or whatever. Um, And my brother was, I guess, more sensitive in that regard. Um, So he, to this day, like, hates the guy. I mean, he's he's passed on. And my brother still is like, nah, like, fuck that guy. You know, like, I don't want anything to do with him. For me, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him because I don't feel like I would be who I am today if it wasn't for him, like, teaching me some of those lessons. And um, so it's interesting that you can look at that. Someone looking at your story would be like, that's abusive. And then you look at it and be like, no, like it, it made me the savage I needed to be. Mm-hmm. Because that's the trajectory that you were on. The one thing that I was confused about by that story is that you would think like that dads that have been through it don't want it for their kids. You know what I mean? When I look at it, like my sons, it's like I would never want them to experience some of the pain that I've had to experience. Um, some of the traumas that that I've experienced, if they can be avoided, I'll, I'll give my life to avoid them. My, my son's going through them. But it's a catch-22 because at a certain point, you got to wonder as a dad, like, am I softening my kids? Am I being too soft on my kids? And I think there's a, a duality with mothers and fathers, you know, like mothers are the nurturers and fathers are the disciplinaries, you know, they're like training, like you said, training their boys. And it's a weird like walk to be in as a father because you're like, man, like I want my boys to be strong men. They're going to be men one day. <clears throat> At the same time, I want them to know that they're loved because you touched on something that that spoke to me with my father where like I had my stepdad, but there was always something inside of me that wanted to make my father proud. Mm-hmm. You know, like he left my mom as well. And it was like, man, like I was always trying to do these things like, oh, look at me, look at me kind of thing, you know, like and even into my 30s, I mean, I just turned 40, but like even in my 30s, I was uh, still seeking my father's approval, you know? And it wasn't until I started actually working with plant medicine that I was able to completely forgive my father hmm. and be like, man, like you couldn't help yourself to be who you were and it is what it is. And like, I can find, I can find approval in myself. Mm-hmm. I don't need your approval anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I release you, like, it's all good. You know, we're, we're good now. Um so the question I have for you is like, what, from doing all that training with your father, where did that lead you? Like, where'd you end up? What organizations did you end up in? Who were you working with? Okay. So this is the thing, right? It wasn't only my dad. My dad was, my dad was like the beginning stages of it. My stepfather was, was in the military. So from all the same ages, like I started shooting 
um, when I was four years old. So like it was, I was being trained from all different angles. Right. My grandfather was a police officer and he would talk about how he wished he could do more to people out there that were hurting women and children, yep. but you can only do so much and how they get out within a short period of time. So I had like just about every man in my sphere yep. was training me or prepping me for e either the military. And if I was going to the military, there's nothing other than special forces. Like you're going straight into special forces. It's just how it goes. Cause right. we've been training you for so fucking long. Right. So it was either going to be special forces or it was going to be prison or it was going to be something where I was going to be able to utilize it and utilize the training in a way where almost like you're so programmed, it's the only thing you can do. Yep. You know? So from all of that training at 11, I started to um, have different sisters and soul sisters that would come to me saying that they were hurt by their fathers. They were sexually molested by their grandfathers or uncles or next door neighbor. And nobody was paying attention to it. Nobody was listening to them. And they felt that I could uh, witness that. Yeah. And so my whole thing was, is I went back to, to like the little homies and was like, Hey, this is what's happening to the girls. We need to do something about it. And they're little surfer skateboarders. It's like, well, what are you talking about? And what do you expect us to do? Yeah, right. But my father married into a woman that was, her family was from Mexico and they were Southsiders, they were Sudanios. And, um, and so that was also a big part of my upbringing was understanding that like gang life. Yep. My, my own family, the Italian side of my family, all I kept hearing when I was young was Salvador Idana, who in Sicily was one of the biggest mafia dons and how he had everyone kneeling at his feet. So like, so it's like my whole, my whole life, I knew exactly what I was going to use for. I never thought I was going to live past 18 because in living a life like that, you don't like, you don't live long. Right. That's just what happens. Right. Usually it's either somebody else that's going to come get you. It's your own that's going to get you. And so at 11, I started, uh, essentially I started my own, uh, the first gang that was supposed to be to, um, to find other young boys that were going to protect the girls. Yep. Again, that was pretty difficult, but instead what it turned into was me joining into other, uh, other like young kid organizations, which even still people would consider gangs, but it was like the, the young gangs. At 14 is when I was jumped into a Sureño gang, which is a South Side Trece. And it's, um, that's when I was in a, in a, in a pickle because I had ran away from my mom's house when I was just turning 11 to go to my dad's at 13, almost 14, um, you know, the, his wife was cheating on him and there was a lot of lying going on and I couldn't stay in the same, I chose not to stay in the same house. So I went to my great grandmother's house and my father shortly left his wife, came to the house. That's where he started up his other lab. And that's when the bikers were coming to my great grandmother's house. And right. even at 14 years old, like with my family, the majority of the deepest part inside of me that I felt was Italian mafia. And we don't bring any of that shit to our family's house. Right. We don't do it. And at, that was the point where I, where I really feel, felt inside myself that my father couldn't be trusted. Because why would he bring the lab to her house? Why would he bring the bikers to her house where she's answering the door and having to see these filthy, filthy animals saying, hey, where's Frank? So on and so forth. And it's frightening her. Yeah. So I went to him and told him, like, look, you're sloppy as fuck. As a 14 year old, I was I was a man in his eyes. I was a man at seven years old. So at 14 years old, like. I just spoke very plainly. You're sloppy. This is not what we should be doing with family. I'm going to have to say something. Stop. My father wasn't the one that just listened to anybody. He was the one that prided himself on never losing a fight, never being a punk, never whatever. So essentially we ended up getting into it. And he told me that it didn't matter what I thought or whatever else he was going to do whatever the fuck he wanted to. So I called my grandparents and this was the first and just about only time in my entire life that hear no evil, see no evil and speak no evil. Right. I actually broke the chain. Yeah. But 
I was doing so to truly be able to keep my great grandmother safe. And I felt that the only person, the only people that could tell my father, like, Hey, like what you do is what you do, but like, you don't bring it to, you don't bring it to grandma's house. Yep. When I spoke to my grandmother and grandfather, they called me, uh, a bitter child and that I couldn't be trusted because I was spreading lies about my father. Interesting. And it was, it crushed me. Yep. It absolutely crushed me. And so now I got all this training. I'm already a little wild savage. I'm, I mean, I started getting kicked out of schools in preschool for fighting. <laughs> like, like, and, and what the suspension and it, preschool suspension was little Frankie got in a fight with three other boys. Right. Like it was never one-on-one -on -one for me. Yeah. It was always multiple on me. Right. So now I'm 14. Yeah. And there's no way that I'm going to continue to allow this to happen. And so uh, I stand my ground with my great-grandmother. My father goes back in with his ex-wife or with his wife. And that was where I was like, okay, grandma's good. I'm hitting the streets. I got all this anger inside of me that my father was went sloppy. Yeah. I started to know that my father was a pathological liar. I started to be able to see into how hurt he was, but I didn't look at him as a hurt individual that was trying his best. I just looked at him as a soft ass punk motherfucker, man. Yeah. Like you, you programmed me for all these years and you lied to me for all these years and you did all this shit and you're the sloppy motherfucker. You're the liar. You're the drug addict. You're the one that you taught me to go after. Yeah. And so I took all of that. Like I said, I was jumped in at 14, the South Side Gang. And in San Diego. And that was where, as a youngster, I was called Big Scrappy. Um, and it, the, the other youngsters, the other 15 youngsters that were jumping me, I, I went like three to four different rounds with all of them and now they couldn't drop me. And so then the elders said, all right, now it's our turn. And so the elders came in and it was after I got down with all the elders that they considered me a Big Scrappy. So at 14 years old with that name, I became essentially a missile yep. um, for that gang and within the org different organizations, criminal organizations in Mexico without naming any. And so that was what I was a missile for for years. 17 was when, um, the, again, there was a discord. Was now at this point, right? So... I, I, I hung around the gang uh, like just after 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, I was a missile. And so I was the one who consistently went to discipline others right. and consistently was one that took, took other uh, gang members from other gangs out of commission. And so that was my sole role was to utilize everything that I was taught and to do it as a little white boy. Yep. Because then no one would have ever known who I was a part of or whatever else, right. which was the, it was like the best kept secret. Yeah. 17 years old. Um, there was more that was happening within the gang and more sh like stronger, strict ideals. And it basically came down to, you're still too proud of your white heritage you need to solely basically be Mexican um, and to speak Spanish, to give up every bit of your life in any other way, shape or form, meaning my mothers, my sisters, my grandparents, so on and so forth. And although I was trained in many different ways, another thing I was trained in was to be very proud of my heritage right. and of all my heritage. And I was raised in a multicultural family and so I stood, I stand, I stood my ground and it came to like, like, you don't, you don't get jumped out of these gangs. Like you're, you're either in or you're dead. Yep. And I had put in enough work within enough years and I, I knew everyone and I knew their grandmothers and grandfathers and nanas and tatas and everything else. Yep. And I was, I was that I was that crazy motherfucker that like, you don't even come to me with any type of a threat because as soon as any type of a threat comes, I'm already three steps ahead of you. Yep. And essentially I was able to have a pass. That's also when um, the woods, the pecker woods came into my life. 
And it was at that point where I was essentially uh, being excommunicated from another family because of how I didn't relinquish my Anglo uh, heritage. Yep. And I wasn't willing to hate my own my own people yep. the way that I was being trained to. Um, it just, it, 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 uh, yeah, it, it hit home right around that age and what a perfect storm to have little quote unquote white supremacists that are coming around that, yep. that we could, uh, join in an understanding of, okay, you're strong. Yeah. You're down. You're with your shit. Yeah. You're white. You care about that. Yeah. And so then it just took off from there. Yeah. That's when I went into prison. That's when I went to the, the youth authority, YA. Well, got so, you there. To YA. Taking my taking the law into my own hands where a uh, soul sister was raped. And the mother called me up saying that he's still in the house and so on and so forth, which is a whole another it, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty intricate story of all of that and how that happened, but in the gist. Yeah, there was a, a rapist who hurt one of my sisters. And that's like the easiest way to have me on your trail is yep. you take advantage of one of the sisters and think you're like some big badass because of it. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I got picked up. She picked up a couple of my homies. We go to the house and dudes up over this, the sister screaming at her and, you know. Forget about it. Yeah, we just, we just get it. Yep didn't know that it was a setup as well. And there was another guy in, in the garage with 357 mm. just waiting for me. Yep. And so that's where it all got a little bit, a little bit more hectic. And I'm being shot at point blank as I'm trying to take care of this dude. And then thinking like, well, who the fuck is this dude? Yep. And close enough to where, and what I mean point blank is, is like when you're wrestling for the gun and it, smacks you and it goes off right here like you have gunpowder burns all over i had gunpowder burns all over my face right i couldn't see for quite a few minutes i couldn't hear for probably about 45 minutes to an hour right. and in all that amount of time i had to get the gun i chose to get the gun away from the man who was shooting the other dude was knocked out um and yeah i had to i had to hurt the other guy with the gun quite severely he was put into um Yeah, uh, life support. Yeah. Yeah, he was on life support for many months. And so, and then I was told, like, get out of here, you know, we'll take care of it. And it was flipped into, there was a, a home invasion. And like I said, the, the story, the story goes in, I'll touch on it just to give you some context. Yeah. So I had a girlfriend and her friend also liked me. Um her friend's mother was being abused by her husband and just wanted to sort of get some refuge by being able to hang out with her daughter and her daughter's friends. Yeah. Her mom was 37. I was going on 17. And because I was the protector, that's just what I always was. The wife sort of looked at me as, um, yeah, like her young protector that she felt she could also have fun with and so on and so forth. And so there was a romantic relationship there. Yep. I get a call from them saying that the husband's going crazy again and he smacked basically all of them. My girlfriend, the mother, the best friend, and that they needed my help. And so immediately I go to the help and I smack the husband around the entire house, just punking him out. Yep. I'm 17, right? He's 40 years old. Yeah. And I'm punking him in front of his family and I'm punking him in front of his children. And I'm, and I'm teaching what I thought I'm teaching him a lesson. Cause that would have been something that like, no, you just, you just don't get the opportunity to do that again. But it was the time where I like showed remorse yeah. for whatever he was going through in life. And I gave him a pass that pass he couldn't take. And so he tried to set me up. Got it. And um, it was all a big, perfect storm for me to come in, for me to try to save the day and then have it spun around and then have me killed. 
what they didn't understand is it's like yeah like guns don't bother me it doesn't scare me i mean if if i'm hit i'm still coming at you right and so it um yeah it was a it was a situation where luckily there was m- many more people that understood what was happening to be able to really speak the truth of it all yeah. but i still was in very much of a state of i see no evil hear no evil speak no evil i'll say the truth of what i did I'll say the truth of the reason why I did it, and then let's let's get it. And I was sentenced to juvenile life. Wow. So that would have been at 17 to 25. That's an eight-year sentence. And just over three years, I served fully, and then the rest was on parole. So then I'm in the youth authority. Youth authority is tough, man. I heard it's like worse than – I've never been to YA, but <clears throat> the, the people I know that have been uh, – there's a lot of people trying to prove themselves there. It's, so. gl- it's gladiator school. Right. It's abs. This is what people don't understand, man. They think that children are going in there to be rehabilitated. Right. You are going in there to become a true gladiator and you're tested at any moment, especially if you're white. Right. Because mm-hmm. the majority of the young that are in there are, it's, it's, it's what society looks at as the ruthless youth of the deranged. You know, and then you have the concept, and even then, 20 years ago, there was the concept of if you're white, you're just a punk ass white boy. Right. And so that gave me, like, not only all the work that I put in on the streets for all those years, but then you put me in with a bunch of dudes that are from 18 to 25 years old, and they're in their prime, and they're all fucking predators. And they're all molesters, and they're all rapists, and they're all drug dealers, and they're all, I just had a heyday. Yep. I had a fucking heyday and it, it was because of my training that I was able to lead. It was because of my training that I was able to stay alive. It was because of my training that I was able to be the most animalistic one. It was because of my training that I was able to run all the money. It was like, I actually had a wide open opportunity to show all my skills right, and not have to say a word. Yep. And so, and that is one of the reasons, and that's not when everything stopped in my life, but that was where, um, like the hurt that I felt from my father, the hurt that I felt from my family that essentially uh, didn't believe me when I was coming out with something that was with so much truth, trying to help my family. Yeah. Like a good boy. Yeah. You know? Um, and I just let it all out on other young men and, and that that I got to get really real with and understanding that I, I wasn't at a space in life where I was able to look at them like myself. I just looked at them like varmint. And what you do with varmint is you kill that shit. Yep. You do not let it live. And so, or you maim it in such a way that it doesn't want to live and it sure as hell isn't going to try to hurt anybody ever again. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is like when you're, um, when you're in there though, for those three years, mm-hmm. um, like getting into any kind of scraps in there, isn't it like adding more time to your, to your sentence and stuff like that? That was like, and the reason I'm asking this is like for me, like I was in County and in, in San Diego as well. Mm-hmm. And ba- uh, Bailey, uh, right there in downtown. I don't okay. know. Is it Bailey? No. Okay. Um, so I was in downtown, like in the like little County mm-hmm. uh, jail or whatever. And uh, I think that's what they call it. I don't know. But uh, while I'm there, I was, I couldn't call anybody because I only knew uh numbers from like a, a different area code i had I, I wasn't from san diego originally so i was like, dude, i don't know any 619 numbers dude <laughs> I, don't, mm. I don't know who to call so the only person i could call was a bail bondsman mm. and i remember calling him and being like listen dude like cause it was late at night you know and i was like hey man like just get this message to my uh at the time my wife um and just tell her like if she doesn't get me out of here like i'm gonna be here a lot longer than i need to be mm. and she'll understand what, what you mean by that and that's why I'm asking because, like, for me, that was my fear. Is like, dude, if I get stuck in here any longer than I than I am right now, mm-hmm. it's gonna end badly. Yeah, I'm gonna get myself into all kinds of shit. Yeah, there's all the different loopholes, man. When you when it goes into like being charged as a juvenile, uh, opposed to being charged as an adult, right? So when it comes to like, say, county time, if you get into a fight, you get six months added on, or Yep. You know, 12 months or whatever, whatever it may be. Right. But it's different because in county time, they're also doing like two to one days and you get two good days for one, whatever it may be in the in YA. Yeah, essentially it's, it's prison, 
right? You're in a 23 in one environment. So 23 yeah. hours in a cell, one hour out in a cage, like a fucking animal um, or rec yard or whatever they want to call it. Depending on what your status is, you're either in literally a cage, just enough to get oxygen or you're in the yard. The thing was though, is that like f- for anyone in YA, you, there's so much fighting that happens. You just know you're going to max out your time. Yeah. As long as you don't stick somebody, this is the thing. This is why razor blades are so prevalent in YA. You can slice somebody and still only get six months added. Oh, wow. But if you actually penetrate with a blade, then that's acted as another charge. And then you're going to go, say you're going to do two years in a state penitentiary. And as long as you still have some type of years left, like if you did it when you were 21, but you're going to max out at 25, you go back to YA to complete your, until your 25th birthday. So for me, like it was, yeah, there's, there's no way around it, especially being white. And I was put into different units where I was literally the only white dude. Yeah. And so you like, whether or not you're going in, cause there's, this is the thing, man. It's it. The cops are involved in all of it. This, the black COs are involved with the blacks. The Mexican COs are involved with the Mexicans. The white COs are involved with the whites. Yep. And that's why there's so much trauma in YA is because you actually have, everyone is a part of the prison. And so the money deals are going through with the cops. The, the uh, prostitution deals are going through with the cops. The ones who are trying to say they're counselors and rehabilitators for victims awareness or narcotics anonymous or whatever it may be, like they're the ones who are getting sucked off for a carton of fucking smokes. Right. So it's just one, it's just one uh, confusing space to be in. And that's why so many just wild out. And everyone's trying to earn their mark. Everyone's trying to earn their stripes. Everyone's trying to earn their colors. Everyone's trying to earn their bolts or swastika. Whatever it is, yeah. it's just war. And so um, as long as, as like once your time, once your time is maxed out, then you like, you don't get any more time. You just can continue to act a fool and can continue to stick, stick, keep slicing, keep slicing, keep doing whatever you're doing because you're going to get out on your 25th birthday regardless. Wow. And that's like, that's not a system that's conducive for actually young people that are going to come out and, and be uh, a healthy product of society. (laughs) Right. To say the least. Yeah. Yeah. You're not coming out rehabilitated. That's for sure. No. And for me, it was like, you know, my dad was always very simple in the way that he taught and, and his whole philosophy was as soon as possible, you go after the biggest, the strongest and the most popular and you, you maim them yep. and you fucking maim them. You rip their eyes out, you bite their nose off, you do whatever you need to fucking do to make sure that people don't need to watch you anymore. All they got to do is just fucking know you're around. Yep. And so... I did what I needed to do and created an opportunity where really, man, the majority of my time was simple. It was simple. It was running everybody else. Yep. Um, you know, I was the one that, you know, and this isn't, there's no bragging whatsoever to it, but you know, like if, if I'm going into, if I was going into a visitation, like one thing that my family would always say is, is like, why do you have so many people coming to the table with all the treats? Why are they buying you everything? Why are they doing all of that? It was all fear-based. Yep. Everything was fear. And that was that was my linguistics, was fear. Yep. Fear, intimidation, all of it, manipulation. And I speak all of this because when people look at me and they're like, put me up on some type of pedestal and, oh, bear heart this and oh, bear heart that. And he's so kind and he's so, you know, <laughs> you've probably lived your whole life as like a, a monk in some monastery <laughs> sitting cross-legged with, you know, and I look at him and it's like, yeah. do y'all listening to any, any, any of my like life? Yep. I'm an average dude, average dude, average, simple, simple, simple man. I'm a father. I want to make sure that my daughters, my children don't have to look over their shoulder. My beloved knows that if I'm away, other brothers are going to be here to keep her safe. She could walk down the street for a few miles and not think that a man is going to honk and beep and catcall and stop and make her feel uncomfortable. 
right? That we know that innocence in every way, shape, and form is, you know, we are going to be there to protect it and to keep it sacred instead of continue to take it, rape it. Like that's as simple as it gets. And then let's have a fucking barbecue with each other. Yeah. So when people are trying to put me up on some type of pedestal for being a medicine man and being all this, y'all, my medicine comes because of how much darkness and how much shadow I was willing to actually live, not just talk about, not just think about, Right. We all have shadow. We all have different types of confusion in current life, prior life, what we think future life is going to be. But like, yeah, I lived it. I lived it. I had, I had who I felt were enemies. And that was anyone if you were a man and you were a predator. Very simple. It didn't matter how old you were. Yep. And and because of that, and because of the different organizations I was a part of, because of my family. It, for so many years, it was like championed. Good job. Good job. You're the best. Yeah. You keep everybody safe. You make sure the bad guys aren't at our doorstep. And I know that I'm not the only one that has a similar understanding of that. There's different, like we were speaking about earlier, there's different types of veterans. Absolutely. There's some veterans that are in the quote unquote military being paid for this. Well, I was in the military too. But I was in a military where like the targets most of the time are not paper. Right. You know, you, you actually like, you got to earn your keep. You're not getting paid specifically for what you're doing. Not only am I doing it, but I'm also hustling in a bunch of other ways to be able to continue to grow the organization, yep. not feeding from the organization, growing the organization. So not only like, is it my job? It's my fucking pleasure. Yep. And I get the best girlfriends and I get this and I get that. And I get the pat on the backs and the attaboys and we're closer to family. Now you can be trusted more now. So where did it shift for you? Like where, where was the shift? Like you go from being, you know, the, the guy that's, that's doing the dirt. That's not afraid of it. That actually welcomes it to learning to, to flip the, the script a little bit and be like, you know what, man, like I'm, I'm done with violence. I think violence will always be a part of you and you're definitely capable of it, but where did the switch happen and why? I'd say the switch <clears throat> happened right before I, right before I came home, right before my 21st birthday. And I just, I knew the trajectory trajectory that I was on would bring me right back to prison. Right. And I felt like I got a pass. Like you got, you got like for me, man, for everything that I did within my past and the different souls that I hurt, different families that I traumatized, me being locked up for three years, an eight year sentence, but three years is nothing, yeah. nothing. So I thought that I got the biggest pass in the world. Well, how am I going to honor spirit? Like, how am I going to honor what I was given? And for me, what I've always wanted was to be a family man. I wanted a wife, I wanted children, I wanted an easy, simple life. Just didn't know what that looked like because I was programmed for something completely different. Right. And so I knew before I got out, I had to switch it all up. And so I created a mantra, instead of being willing to kill, I'm gonna kill with kindness. Instead of burying, I'm gonna bury with success. So, it was my first opportunity to truly choose a different way. The thing was, though, is that that was just the start because then I utilized all of my trauma as my motivating factor to get the prettiest wife, to start my own business and make, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, easy training dogs, yep. um, to try to prove to everybody that I, I wasn't the same person. Because this, that was another thing. Like my family, they knew that I was a part of stuff, but like I was, I was raised with Italian mafia understanding. You don't bring that shit to family. You don't bring it to the women. You're loving and you're compassionate. And when you're out doing what you need to do to put in the work and to earn, like that's where that's, uh, they know you differently than your family. All right. So I was just no longer willing to hurt people because of my different ideals. And I was going to come up. Did you read something? Was it something that like, um, 
that shifted inside of you? I mean, being inside YA, so were, like, were you reading? Was it like something like what changed? Like, what was like, it's like for me, like I read uh, the uh, the Art of Happiness mm-hmm. and um, by the Dalai Lama, and I'd say that that was probably the book that like kind of opened my eyes to be like, man, I'm, I'm an angry motherfucker, and like this is not gonna work. Yeah. You know, yeah. I need to, I need to shift. Yeah. So was there something for you that like where like there was a catalyst to be like enough? Yeah, no, no sex. Cause I, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to have sex with a man. Right. And that proposition in there is you're either fighting or you're fucking. It's real simple. Yeah. That's what little boys, that's what young adolescent men do when they're put with each other. Yeah. They're either going to fight or they're going to have sex because their hormones are going so strongly. I chose to fight. And so it was like, I just, I want the softness and the sensitivity of a woman. That is actually what changed me. All the books that I read, I, used to, I read two to three books a day yep. to the point to where I would think in narrative mm-hmm. and and not like thinking quote unquote normal. Right. Right. It was, it was like a story was coming out and yeah. And at that point still in life, any, any spiritual kind of book or anything else like that, I would have scoffed at thinking like yeah you could say that when you're sitting up on top of a fucking mountain come with me in the middle of the streets and think that you're going to meditate a bullet away from your face yeah you know like that that would have been i was still in a i was still very much in a in an understanding of life of yeah that's all good because you didn't grow up on the streets yep and so when i came home all i wanted to feel was love like that's all I wanted to feel, the soft touch of a woman, the soft touch, the caress on my face, down my beard, like just to be able to sink my head in. I didn't even necessarily need the sex. Everything in my life was just so hard. And so just to be able to lay down and know like I didn't have to, I didn't have to keep looking over my own shoulder was all I was looking for. And so relationships um, kept me in a state of where it was like, as simple as it may seem, because like I said, prison wasn't hard for me. Prison was easy for me. So it's like, I can easily go back. I'll make more money in there. I'll be able to run shit in there in a way that's just how I know it anyway. And I don't have to be around so many soft ass people that think that they're actually strong. But like, there's no women to be able to have sex with. And so it was sex and the softness of a female touch that truly kept me out. And then when I, then I was married and once I was married, that's where a big switch happened because now like I have responsibility, my responsibility is to my wife, my responsibility is to my family. My responsibility now is to be the healthiest uh, man that I can for my children that are going to be coming. But I didn't know actually what that was because no matter uh, the house we had or the timeshare that we had down in Cabo or the, uh, like uh, everything, the way that we went on trips everywhere, we were the couple everyone wanted to be like. I was still dying inside. Yeah. I was still absolutely dying because of everything else that had happened in life that even though I could justify and I could make it seem that I did everything for the right reasons, there was still so much in my past that I was hiding. As soon as I came home, I dedicated that if, if I was not going to go back, then nobody, unless you knew me while I was in prison, you would not know that I was ever in prison. Interesting. So I continued to lie to everybody. I continued to manipulate. I continued to do all the same things, but not from a perspective of like, I'm a predator doing it and I'm going to put my energy into you without you saying so. I'm just going to spin you up so you'll never actually know the truth about me. And you'll just continue to say how great of a person I am because I still need that validation. Mm. So it didn't actually, truly, none of it changed. I got better. I was able to be in society. I was able to be an active part in society. I was able to not hurt others that I knew were predators and hurting others. I was able to shut off my hunt, my hunting instinct, you know, because there's a complete, there's, it's the same, but it's different. When you're hunting an animal, there's a specific type of hunt. When you're hunting a human, it, it takes on a different role. Yep. I was no longer willing to be the hunter of humans unless you come after my family, so on and so forth. Right. So that was where the biggest change happened a decade ago. 
And this is this is where it really sinks home for me and where bare heart really came into play. My brother, who I was raised essentially like twins, he was six weeks apart from me. He was my number one, Andres Cavazuela Saputo. And this is a this is a type of man that was very sensitive, never would hurt a fly. Um Yeah, like some like one of the most pure-hearted people you'll ever meet. Yep. And his girlfriend murdered him. Wow. And this is a woman who was around our family. This is a woman who acted like she loved him so much. This is a woman that he took care of her son. Uh, she was a heroin addict, and he did everything that he could to try to help her get off heroin, especially while he was doing what he needed to do in NA and AA and everything else. And, you know, he took a similar life of my father, got arrested for slang and coke and so on and so forth. And so it was like he was doing everything that he could to be able to better himself, and he actually made it, and he did it. And no matter how much I told him, like, dude, she's going to, like, I knew she was going to kill him from day one. I had a dream about it the day that he came to introduce. And like, when you're, what I mean by number one, my, like my brother and I never had an argument wow. in our entire life. Not one argument. Remember, we were, we were trained to work together. Yeah. And because he looked completely differently than me, he was very dark brown and I am of what I am. Nobody ever knew we were brothers unless you went to school with us because our, our last name was the same. Yeah. So we were able to, to really work together in a very dynamic way because no one ever thought that we would be in that close of relation. Yeah. So this is a gentleman who I truly never had one argument with. And the only argument we had was when I called him and said, bro, I had a dream last night. She's going to kill you. And he's, he laughed at me and he's like, dude, he's like, she's 100 pounds. Like, how could you ever think that she's going to kill me? He was 350 pounds, yeah. just a little under my height huge, huge bear of a man. They called him King Kong was his nickname. <laughs> and so, and he laughed and he's like, bro, like, come on, man. Like, yeah, she's a junkie, but you know, she, she ain't that one. Yeah. And I told him, I said, she's got other people involved, man. We don't know who this lady is. You know, like it, it ain't good. So two days before my birthday, I get a call in 2012 and saying that my brother was injected with heroin and also had different benzodiazepines and he went through uh, heart failure. And so what happened was, was that she, she, she told him that she had cheated on him with one of his best friends. He got super angry. He went up to the hotel room, took some Zannies, some Zanny bars just yeah. to knock out so he didn't just fucking rage. Got in his boxers, went to sleep, and then the next door people came over, cracked him over his head, injected him with heroin. And the first on scene responders I knew personally, because I was an EMT as well, after I came home and they told me what they came into and that he came, like when they gave him Narcan, he came out in like the biggest fight you could ever imagine. And he was tossing everybody. Yeah. So, you know, he was in a fight right before. And yeah, he aspirated multiple times. They kept getting him back and he died on my birthday on the 23rd of December. And so simply because of that, I wasn't willing to hurt anybody for you hurting other people because they're not the family. But now you take my number one. Nah, like that whole eight years, you know, nine years, whatever it was of me being home and all the work I thought I was doing, right? All the work I thought I was doing by training with different uh, different special forces, different Delta um, D, D men, different this, different that, just to keep my, keep my animal enough to where I wasn't gonna hurt other people. Yeah. It was like, oh yeah. And plus you add on that, you know, I have so much experience in the bush and being a wilderness survival instructor, like, all right, I'm definitely not going back to prison, but I'm definitely not going to allow this one to ride. Yep. And so, yeah, that's where everything changed. I was on my way. I planned it. I, I fuck, forced my wife. 
um, to not tell anybody of what I was going to do because she need like we had a child at that point. She needed to know that or we were about to have a child at that point. And it was just like, I'm a real dude, man. And if you're my wife, you're my ride or die, no matter what. And this is what gets to happen. She gets to die. And anyone else that's involved in this gets to die as well. You won't see me for a year. I'm going to do my own thing. And then I'll slip in when I can. And like, she held it. She held it. And I was, I had it all planned out. I was on the way to her house. I already, all the, like, I, you, you got taps, man. When you're involved in that world, you got everybody that still wants to work for you. Yep. So that was when everyone clicked back in from my past yep. and was like, hey, big homie, we heard what happened. Like, we could pick her up. We can get her in Mexico tonight. Like, how do you want to roll this? And I called it the way I wanted to call it. And I'm on my way to the house. I literally get to her house and I hear my brother in my ear saying, bro, don't let her get you too. That was my contract with her. That wasn't your life's contract. Mm-hmm. Choose love. And it's like, I passed it on and I kept on going. And it was like, there he was again. There he was again. Choose love. Choose love. This isn't your contract. Choose love. And I fucking broke down. I bet. Like broke down. And knew at that point if I was going to spare other life then I got to die myself and because my daughter was was already born I I got to do what I felt any honorable man would do when you're at that point and that is to choose my family first and yeah. so I chose my family and in that it was immediately I started seeking different ways to die myself, but to also know that I was going to come back. And so that's where, like, I, I've been working with different medicines since the time I was eight years old, which is a huge, it's a huge reason why I felt like I stayed alive. Yeah. And, and everything was because I was able to utilize my intuition much more. I was able to utilize my psychic skills. I was able to understand when to go out on the yard, when not to go out on the yard, when a hit was happening on me. I've had many different potential hits put out on me in many different times in life. Um, But the medicines always gave me the opportunity to know when it was going to happen and set things up in a different way. And so that's when I started truly like going down into Central America and um, yeah, allowing myself to die as many times as necessary. Because up until then, my whole life was to not die. Yeah. But once I actually allowed myself to die as many times as necessary it's when i truly understood like how to live and why living was so important and nine years ago almost 10 years ago was when i promised what some people call god or what some people call spirit or their higher self goddess the universe whatever you want to say allah that that's when i gave my full and undistracted dedication to love freedom safety and truth and actually living that and embodying that and so that was my time to choose love for my family that was my time to choose love for my brother that was time to choose love for the people that took my brother and it was the hardest thing that i did but it is why i choose love is because i know the fucking complete opposite of it i perfected the complete opposite of it and it's why it's it's such a driving force in my life that it like it doesn't matter what anyone else says it doesn't matter how many other people would understand this type of a uh, an honor based way of understanding it like spirit has it locked in in me so like that's enough yeah what do you think was the uh was there a specific like um medicine that worked the best for you that that was like the the, the aha moment for you or was it just like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to seek this ego death as many times as possible until I get the lesson that I need? Not any, not any medicine in particular. The, the thing was, is like, because I had connected to the medicines at such an early age and then throughout life, they all played a very specific role when I, when I needed them and when I was working with them. Right. And because I was such a young boy, as I started working with these medicines, I didn't have any other type of insight that other cultures worked with these medicines, had specific songs for these medicines, had specific names for the medicines. Like right. none of that was ever in my in, in my understanding. But the way that I learned was essentially just to work with the medicine to 
and what I mean by like working with the medicine, I, I started holding ceremonies for my different homies and for different people before I was 10 years old. And what that looked like for me looking back now is, is I just knew that I was going to do what I already did. Make sure that whatever container I was in, everyone was safe. Yep. Nobody was being messed with. Nobody was being touched. And the medicine was going to show you something very specific, but you don't fuck around with each other. Right. right. This isn't a party. Like I got that very early on. So whatever medicine I was working with, I was listening to like the way I conceptualized it and didn't go crazy because I couldn't go to my family and talk about it. Like my dad was a doper, and he, but it, he wasn't anyone that, he didn't smoke cannabis. He didn't work with mushrooms or peyote or anything like that, gypsum weed. And so I associated the individual medicine with somebody in my family that was an elder that I loved and I respected and I would never lie to. So like something about uh, cannabis, my grandmother, Rosemary, it's her energy perfectly. And so whenever I would work with cannabis, I would be speaking to my grandmother, listening to my grandmother. Whenever I would be working with a different medicine, I would be, look, I would be talking to my grandfather. Whenever I'd be there, it would be an, an uncle. You know, there was already somebody in my family that I paired with that when I would be breathing very deeply with the energy as it was, as it was alivening inside of me, it was an immediate like, oh, that's you. And so I had a roster of a family, that's like a hidden spiritual family that no one even knew about. Yeah. And that is, that's what, mm, like for me, like I give, I give the medicines a lot of credit for the reason why I'm even able to share my story. Because it, it gave me the, they gave me the opportunity to understand how to work with them individually and breathe them in instead of thinking that I know just because my heritage tells me this is where I'm supposed to be talking to these plants. Right. It was very organic and authentic. If there was one medicine that helped my consciousness understand death more than others, um, I would say by far it was Bufo Vodius. It was what? Bufo. Bufo Vodius. I don't uh, even know what that is. Five MEO DMT. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. From the toad. Yep. So that that medicine and the way that I was trained in that medicine and the apprenticeship that I went through was was one where the ego was able to check offline. And when I came back all those times, I, I literally went through large amounts of time where I was remembering how to smell. I was remembering really how to see. I was remembering how to feel. I was remembering how to speak. I was remembering how to move. Um, and really connect to the different animals inside of me that in, in, and in a healthy way, not in a way that I was trained to, yeah. right? Like the training is always going to be the training, no matter, no matter what we were trained to do, it's always going to be there. There's always going to be the reserves. If we absolutely need them, there's always going to be a little bit of that mentality that we could tap back into. But what I was trying to kill, the medicines were being very clear, like, man, that's not something you can kill but it is something you can integrate. Yeah. And so stop trying to kill it like it's your enemy. It's what kept you alive. Integrate it. Like, em em don't embrace the darkness of it. Embrace the intention of why it all happened in the first place was to try to help. Yeah. And that's powerful too, because um, you know, it's a conversation I, I've had with my wife recently that, you know, when we've had interactions with each other, um, I've kept my anger in check a lot, you know, where in, in different situations where I just, I could lash out. I could let like the old part of me come out and it's not going to be good. Um, and not necessarily with her, just with other situations where we were involved. And I told her, I said, sometimes like you, you need to allow me to express myself the way that I need to express myself without, without me fearing your judgment or your kind of, um, condemnation of like my normal human and like human responses to things. Uh, Cause sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes like my anger and my fierceness is warranted. Um, and it, sacred. Yeah. And it's like, and there, it shouldn't be. And so that's a perfect, I'm glad you said that because like I was for so many years trying to run from that 
yeah. trying to run away from like the the anger and the you know the violence and like whatever. Because I think if you ask like a lot of the people that I grew up with, I don't think anybody would tell you that I was a a, a bad guy. I think they would all tell you I had a good heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think they would also tell you that I would rip your fucking face off if it came down to it. Um, so I was definitely the protector. I was the one. I would never. I was never a bully. Yeah. I was never a guy that would ever uh belittle or pick on somebody i mean there's people that to this day if i have an interaction with them and they bring something to the table that i may have said or done to them in the past that was hurtful i genuinely like will go back after all these years and and try and heal that Mm -hmm. because that's never my intention is never to hurt anybody it's always to be that protector you know to be like no i'm here to like make sure you're good so if you know like if i'm in the room you know you're safe. You know that you're okay. I'll take sure. a bullet for you. I'll do whatever I got to do to make sure that we're all dialed in here. And um, it's powerful. And I think going to, and so because of that, going to the ceremony that you and I first sat in, um, I uh, I was nervous, you know, because like for me, being the protector, you go into a situation, it's like, I don't know anybody here. Like, I don't know who these people are. And like, it's weird because when you're in that protector space, like, you need a chance to like let your guard down every once in a while. Totally. Put your shield down, put your sword down, and just relax. And it's very hard to find uh, the people in your life or the the tribe in your life that allows for that, you know. Um, and so when I went to that space, like initially, I was very nervous. I, I didn't really know what to expect. And um, and obviously, like we said, the cameras were <laughs> really weird. Um, but I think having you there and having uh, Ian there in specific. Both of you guys, for whatever reason, like I could pick up on that protector energy where like I knew I was safe. I knew I was good. Like I the, nothing was gonna happen to me. I could I could let go. Like I was all right. And um, and that's powerful, man. And it's it's hard for I think it's hard for a lot of guys in specific to let their guards down and, and in that veteran space. And I don't mean veteran, like like you said, veterans come from all walks of life. It's not just veterans from the military, veterans from all kinds of combat in mm-hmm. life. And uh, when you come from that space, it's hard, man. It's hard to have that, uh, the ability to kind of just let it, let it go. And uh, you and I were talking before the podcast, uh, one of my good buddies took his own life uh, last week and it tore me up inside, man. I was tore up over it and I still am. And I think part of the reason why is because he was that protector. He was one of the protectors and it like hurts my soul to know that like one of my other protector brothers is gone. Like when you see what's happening in the world right now, like we need now more than ever to unite. We need now more than ever to like get those people that are the ones that are powerful, that are the ones that are protectors, that are are the ones that despise predators, you know, and and tyranny and get all those guys together. So when you lose one of those people in your tribe, it's fucked up. And so like I love the fact that like you're using your past experience to give space for people to heal the ways that, that you have. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. without without that, we are all too dangerous. Oh, hundred percent. And and that that is real. Yeah. And and it's like we can we can come back. Like right now in life, stuff's happening. And if 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 the strong within our society just said, "Hey, that's enough," we would switch it in a month. Yep. We would switch everything because we've already put our lives on the line so many different times, and we know it works when we work together. It's not at that point yet because still so much healing needs to happen. Yeah. If we united at this point, we probably would kill each other. Yeah. Because, and that's just the fucking truth of it, man. Because they're, they're in the times of confusion, especially if we haven't worked on some of the neural pathways that, that can trigger us into some type of aggressive behavior yeah. or the feeling of we have to look over our shoulder at everything and we can't trust anybody and so on and so forth. Like we will implode. Yeah. More healing has to happen. It gets to happen for the men and women that are actively in protector role. So that way we can see the predator that's still inside of self. Yeah. That's funny. Um, I'm glad that you said women too, because I think we're very, or I'm guilty of being like, oh, men, men, men. But it's like, no, there's definitely women out there that are protectors as Absolutely. well. And I've been around some of those women where it's mm-hmm. like, where I feel held by them, where it's like, oh, cool. Like I can like, I can relax a little bit right now because yeah. I got a savage right next to me. It just happens to be a woman, but yeah. she can get down too. And so, um, and and that's the best. It's actually the best team. Right. It's the absolute best team of it. 
you can work very, very, very well together when we understand how to complement each other and all of right. it. Um, and, and that's where we get to, from my perspective anyway, if we come together, that's very positive. If we train together, that's even more positive. It's when we heal together, mm. come together, train together, everything changes. Because then, then we're not alone. Spot on, man. I, um, you're so right. And I, you know, we were talking earlier that, you know, I'm very guilty of going into my own cave, you know, like when I'm in my own head or like I can look at the world. I think a lot of people can look at the world right now and not be very hopeful for the future, you know, in a lot of ways, just kind of the way that things are shaking out. But with that being said, I think now is the time more than ever for us to heal and unite. And I think you're 100% accurate that right now, if it were to go down, we'd be killing each other. There'd be a lot of protectors killing each other because there's still a lot of trauma. There's still a lot of hurt. There's still a lot of resentment. There's still a lot of like inability, like you said, to integrate some of that like ferocious, like violence, you know, uh, capability. Um, and it, it's spot on because I think that's why like, when I, when I'm in the space, when I was in that space with you and then after that, when I uh, went back into plant medicine and I, the ceremony that I went to was specific um, veterans within the military only were allowed at this uh, ceremony. And it was one of the only other times in my life, just like the ceremony I sat with you where I felt like I can let my guard down. Cause I was literally in the room with a bunch of fucking savages, mm -hmm. like true savages. And I was like, I'm good. Like, I don't like, I don't need to worry about anything right now. Like I'm totally good. And you know, I, I was sitting with a therapist once and he asked me, you know, where do you feel the uh, the most safe? Because we were talking about sourcing our own safety. And because I've always been the guy where like, I just don't, I don't trust people very well. You know, I don't trust, I'm not very trusting of like just random strangers and stuff like that. And uh, he's like, where do you feel the most safe? And I was like, um, it's a great question. I was like, probably on a military base with all my brothers and he and sisters, you know, and he's like, well, why is that? And I was like, because I know without a shadow of a doubt that if anything goes down in this base, like, all of them would have my back and, the, and, and it's, and it's uh, definitely mutual. You know what I mean? So like, it's the one time where like I could go, I don't drink anymore, but if I was still drinking, I can get shit face drunk and no, I'm not going to be taken advantage of. I'm going to mm -hmm. be taken back to my room and mm -hmm. protected. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a help. There's, there's so, so much beauty in that, you know? And, and, uh, and I think that's what we need is more healing, man. People need to heal yeah, and then come together. Um, yep. Then we'll, and thank you for expressing all that. I agree with it a hundred percent. And if like, we'll know what to do with all of our training when we've healed, right? There's so many of us, like we have all this training, we have all this life experience, we have all this lived experience, but we don't know how to integrate it. Right. And it's because the healing part of it is missing. If we don't actually heal, it won't come full circle of why it was all so important. Why there's been life that may have been taken, why there have been situations that we had to make, uh, like, make very wise decisions in very short periods of time. Right. Right. Especially under pressure. Why engagement for some of us is like the hardest thing to disengage from, you yeah. know, because it becomes our meditation for me engaging with other human and human flesh was my meditation. Yeah. So how do I actually integrate that? If, if that's, if that's my lived experience, it'd be almost impossible and let alone to be able to know that other people may have similar life experience. That's the easiest thing that we could do. Nobody has the same life experience as I do. Nobody will understand me. I'm all alone. I might as well be a lone wolf that has all these very valuable skills, but I'm not willing to actually continue to help others because I'm still so wounded myself. Yep. If it goes down, all of us at this point will still be lone wolves. We'll do what we can for our insular family. Yeah. But what about when the, when the brother who's just like us is now looking for food? How are we going to be able to differentiate him? Or is he just going to be that's another enemy? And that's where the healing gets to come in. That's, and that, that is why like being able to, uh, to lead and co-lead and follow in different small, very tactical groups is still very important if, if more now than ever yep. understanding how to be able to branch those groups in healthy aligned and effective ways understanding how to move with each other and not only just like how to move with each other with firearms and how to move with each other in in, in wartime but how to move with each other and, and dance with each other how to move with each other around the fire how to play music with each other 
right? How to simply just be able to sit down, watch our kids play and not be thinking about all the stuff in our past. And if we are thinking about that, give ourselves the opportunity to come into circle and say, hey, this is still circling. I need a little bit of help. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a space where I can go to another therapist that doesn't have really a fuck clue of what's, what I'm talking about because yeah. they're still just regurgitating what they had in their book manual while they were getting their degree. Yep. We read through all of that. Yep. There is that predator inside of us that immediately knows when somebody is not. Absolutely. And so if that doesn't get in check, if we can't integrate that one, then we're never really going to be able to trust. And I, I feel you a thousand percent, bro. Like it still is one of, one of the challenges that I'm actively working on daily is to allow myself to trust more and knowing that I will be taken advantage of, knowing that people don't have the same understanding of respect. And it's not because of their own doing, it's because of the stuff that I was yeah. conditioned with as a child. I get to integrate that. I get to understand that people are trustworthy, even though that they will break trust. If like, if we are to continue the mission, and this is what I think most of the brothers and sisters that are coming from any type of veteran, and whether that be the military or whether that be gangs or whether that be prison or whatever it may be, there are four pillars I feel that truly embody all of us. And the reasons why we were willing to go to the extent it wasn't for the thirty thousand pay bump, it wasn't right. for, it wasn't for the the pins, it wasn't for the color, it wasn't for the 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 street credit, it wasn't for the influence in the pin, it wasn't for any of that. It was to actually feel loved, right? When we're in those groups, when we're in our di- our different groups, we feel a different kind of love. And even though it may be a brutal love at times, there may be discipline happening. Like you feel like a part of the organization. Yep. We also get a chance to feel some type of freedom. And if we're not actually being able to feel it, we're fighting for it, for our people, for our heritage, for our race, for the street corner, for our society, for the country that we may live in, whatever it may be. Freedom is such an important factor for all of this, just to simply be able to live in a free way, speak my truth, right? Truth is another huge one. And to feel safe in speaking the truth. And that's why with La Fuerza Sagrada, the sacred force, like when people sometimes talk about special force and that's, that's a whole medicine. But when we bring the special forces into the sacred force, that's when it's integrated. Absolutely. And that is what my, one of the number one main missions is, is to actually create any and all special forces that have been out there in all walks of life. Let's integrate that into the special force and fucking unite. And not to necessarily go after anything or anyone, but to understand that we are valuable. Our life experience is valuable. The the amount of death that we've been able to see and been able to witness and been able to work through is valuable. The amount of challenge, the amount of all of it, like it's, there is so much value to it in our stories. If we stop being the lone wolf, if we come together, if we share some of our story, if we have the different healing opportunities and capabilities and, and learnings, then we can do so in a healthy way. Everyone benefits from that. We benefit from that. We will want to live more and actually be able to breathe the fresh oxygen that gives us life in the first place. We'll be able to see our children laughing and smiling and at times crying and going through life and know that we, we deserve to be here, to okay. be able to watch our seeds grow into something beautiful. We should be able to be able to see the, our beloveds with true smiles on their face, living in joy, not being afraid of our own hand. Right. Not being afraid of the temperament that we have because sometimes just our muscle memory, it may not even be the psychological shit. It's just the muscle stuff. Yep. Somebody comes too quick at me. Somebody comes and puts their hand on my shoulder at a time where I'm not feeling safe. Somebody comes in close to my ear and says something that you're like, you're, you're an inch too close. Yep. But if the people around us, like they will trust us more in the protector role if we are more honest about them in the beast role in our different process of what we've come from. 100%, man. What drives you now? What's your driving force? It's simple, bro. It's an honor-based society. My driving force is not to like evolve to the point of ascension and, and to 
supposedly go into different uh dimensions forever and and live as a light being or whatever some people are like meditating on top of the mountain forever for right. no hell no i'm a simple ass dude i want to make sure that while i am still young and in my body and for however many years i have left like i'm a father plain and simple i'm a daddy no matter what happens within my relationships, I'm still always going to be a daddy. And so in that, if I can do my best to work on whatever it is that's inside of myself and to be honest about that and to create safe space for other people to do so and to do so from a perspective of this is to create an honor-based society, one that no one has ever really truly known of because of how much slavery has been in our world yeah. since the beginning of time, every people's, all people's, if we can heal if we can get back to what honor truly is with inside of ourselves and within our communities and big mama at large as simply as this dude our children won't have to look over their shoulder anymore it's not my mission right it's the mission and and it, it's us to be able to come together so that's why i've taken on a life as a reverend that's why i've taken on a life since the time where I dedicated to spirit that I was no longer going to lie. I was no longer going to manipulate. I was no longer going to hurt others because they were willing to hurt me. When that fully took on, like it was so that way I didn't feel alone. And if something happens to me, I want to make sure you got my children, man. Yep. I want to make sure that my brothers and sisters can take care of my beloved and can continue to grow within a healthy ecosystem. So I'm in service the majority of the time. I'm in the bush helping train and helping people remember how to heal themselves. I'm with the medicines so people can have an understanding of how to work in a healthy way and for with longevity. I'm in a way of being able to be very, very, very honest about what some of my past has been, all of my past, but specifically right now, just some of it, of how and where the nuggets come from. When somebody sees quote unquote Bearheart, Frank Sebastian Saputo, when they see me and they see that I can just sit there and play music and have a joyful look on my face 24 hours a day if needs be, if I can be a father for my children, if I could be a father figure for other children, if I'm just plugging into the ecosystems to be a healthy form of it. Right. And I've gone through enough years of thinking that I'm going to reverse all my old shit. Like I, I, I went through a lot of shame and blame and guilt in myself and I'm going to become this healer and I'm going to do this and I'm going to help thousands of people. So that way, karmically, uh, it'll be in my favor, <laughs> right. like all that bullshit. Yeah. Like, yeah, it may have it may have felt, you know, a, a part of my system, the validation of I'm not that same savage because my family would have said that I was my my mother calls me angel boy. Yeah, I was angel boy to her and I've been called a fucking monster by other people. Yeah. Right. And you know what? The truth of it all, I'm all of it. Yeah. I'm all of it. But at this point in life, I've dedicated to being a man of love. And that doesn't mean you're not going to get choked out. Yep. Right. As well, we, I got choked out. We yeah. trained together. <laughs> <laughs> as as we know, as we both know, bro, like, and I think that we can still resonate in a soft way. Yeah. Like we will feel safe if we know that our our loving family will also hold us accountable. Right? Absolutely. And to train with us to make sure that we still are at the top of our game and not because of survival, because we're actually willing to thrive with each other. It's now it's not about being afraid to die. Right? We're past that. We know we're not we know we're not afraid to die. Yep. Whether or not when death comes, so on and so forth, if if we're gonna leave our family, that's probably the hardest thing for it. But we're not afraid of it. But we most of the time when I ask people, are you still afraid to truly live your truth and like fully show up? That's where people say, yes, I am, because I don't even know what that looks like. We don't have enough examples of what that can truly be in an authentic, integral way. Yeah. And that's what I'm hoping to be able to do with the rest of my life is to be able to learn more for myself, to be an example for others that we all get to uh, we all get to have an opportunity to fully thrive and live with each other in community so we don't have to lone wolf it anymore and hold back all that juice that we trained for. 
Do you ever feel any pressure, you know, as far as uh, being the healer, being the protector, being the one that's at the uh, the top of your game? And like people go to you for counsel, people go to you for like protection, people go to you for safety, people go to you to like get like what they need, like the healing that they need. But who's taking care of Bearheart? Good question, man. You know, I, I, I do my best to be very consistent with reminding people that I'm not the healer, that I'm not the shaman, that I'm not the guru. I'm just speaking my truth as it authentically flows out. And I'm creating an opportunity for people to come by the fire to do the same in their own flavor and fashion. Right. Um, but there, there has been over the years, there has been a pressure because although when people say, it, it was one of the main reasons why I started witnessing space in itself, because when I started coming into different circles and coming out with my story, it's like, oh yeah, Bear, we want you to be honest, but that's a little too honest. <laughs> right. You know, you're creating fear in everyone around you. <laughs> right. Like, we don't know how we can, like, you're saying that you've done all these horrible things and it creates almost a sense of like, wow, we trust you more. And also like, damn, how do we be around you? So I started creating my own circles for people that also had similar stories where they, it just, it wouldn't have been appropriate and it definitely wouldn't have been listened to, felt and understood. Yeah. And so with that, even still in community, I've noticed that in specific uh, set and settings, when I even, when I start to bring my energy, even a couple octaves over what typical bear heart is, everyone's like, yeah. Like fuck, what's gonna happen? Is he gonna? Is he gonna? Is he gonna go back? Is you know? Are we potentially gonna be hurt? And then the and the thing is, is the men yeah. feel the fear. The women are like, fuck yeah, oh yeah. Like show yourself, yep. Because that's how we're gonna. That's how we're gonna meet you, and that's how we're gonna trust you even more. Is if we can actually see some of that other energy that's inside of there. Right. And so I, I just started creating and co-creating different circles where I could also be in my work yep. at the same time and be honored in it. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough to where it satiates um, some of the different aspects of me that are not always just super happy-go-lucky. And I, I choose in my base because we all have the opportunity to choose. My base is joy. My base is compassion. My base is staying in, a, in an energetic vibration of welcoming energy instead of yeah. blocking it. Um, but man, like if it wasn't for this work, if it wasn't for the times in deep nature where nobody's around for hundreds of miles and miles for me to get as big as what my energy can to sort of release, you know, if we look at, if we look at some energy coming inside of us as um, like a pressure cooker and just like, I actively help people remember these tools because I need them so much myself. Right. Not to say, this is how you're going to end up like me. Fuck all that, man. I don't want anyone to end up like me. We are all so special individual. That's what creates a pack. Yep. I'll show up in my authenticity. I only want to see people in their own authenticity. But sometimes people won't actually allow themselves to go there unless they see somebody else going buck wild. Oh, for sure. And buck wild in a way of, oh, but he can also keep it in his own space. So then I get a chance to go buck wild in my own space as long as I don't put that in other people's space then that gives me a healthy, sacred way to be able to move through this energy. Yep. You know, and that, that is what has helped me not feel so much pressure. Yep. It's important, man, because I think that there's a, there's a lot of pressure put on people that are in those roles to constantly be available, you know, available to other people, processing whatever they need to process. And I think that's, maybe it's a, our soul agreements, or maybe it's it's our life contract to be those people that people come to and that, that are seeking counsel and whatever. But I know for me personally, like uh, just with doing the podcast, you know, people would reach out to me and talk about the podcast or whatever and, and send me a lot of their problems. It wasn't a lot of their like, uh, so I mean, you still get uplifting messages, but a lot of the stuff that I was getting was a lot of people sharing a lot of like just heaviness with me, you know? And I have to be aware that I can't, I can't take that all on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I can do my best to like counsel and, and give my opinions about things yep. um, or how I feel about it or what my experience was and how I uh, navigated some of those uh, challenges. 
Um, but I can't, I can't own any of that. It's yeah. not mine to own. It's their stuff, you know? Yeah. It's not yours and, to own or to hold. Right. Right. And that's, that's a reframe that I try to help people with all the time when they say like, I'm having to hold all this space. I'm having to hold all this space. Well, right. even in the linguistic of it, you're going to get tired. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's, and it's not your responsibility to hold anyone else's weight, but can we witness the space? Yeah. So instead of a space holder, a space witnesser. Absolutely. Even with our relationships, you know, I've noticed that since I started uh, kind of transitioning out of the whole like holding space all the time, like more of just like witnessing it, mm-hmm. my relationship with, with my wife is better, you know, because like she can like have her fiery storm of like emotion and I don't need to own it. You know, I don't need to take it personally. It's mm-hmm. not like her. It's like she's just working through her her stuff. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and it's uh, before you just you you create this drama circle because it's like, oh, you're like attacking me and now i feel attacked and so i'm gonna attack back and no good is gonna come of that you know um so i'm glad you said that because i think people listening to this episode um need to hear that because sometimes like people are processing their stuff whether it be your significant other a co-worker whatever just let them process it yeah you know the power that i see in people that i the people that i've i I guess that i've valued the most or that i i respect and honor the most uh, one in specific guy that I, I can think of right now um, was a SEAL Team 6 guy. And we went through grade school together. Uh, and then I moved away and then came back in junior high. So then we went through this, uh, junior high and high school together. And uh, he was going through some pretty heavy like life stuff and uh, outside of the military. And the way he handled it, I was just like in awe of him. I mean, just like things getting thrown at him. Like, I mean, just a lot of like crazy energy coming his way. And like, he, uh, he just stayed calm through it all. And, uh, and I was shocked by, I was like, damn, dude, how do you compose yourself, man? And, uh, you can't ever let your emotions be, uh, I guess like overpower your intelligence or your logic, you know? Um, and I think that there's some, there's like beauty and power in that. So I think that, um, knowing now that like it's not my space like it's not my job to like hold space it's just to witness it and so i'm glad you said that that's awesome and i hope other people listen to that and take take that advice you know don't take it personally when people are coming at you a certain that's way right. there's a there's a there's a fine line you know of respect you know if someone comes into your space where it's like okay now you're crossing that threshold i get that but sometimes people are just they just need to vent man it's not yeah. even about you that's right <laughs> and most of the time it has nothing to do with you right you know it's it, you're just the one in front of them at that time yeah and if if we come about it from the witnessing perspective, then we'll also be able to witness ourselves more when our own energies, our energy in motion, starts to be very stimulating with inside of ourselves. Oh yeah, because it's when the it's when the emotions start to come high that a lot of people check offline and they lose their faculties and they lose all the tools, and they go into more of the fight or flight. Oh, for sure. I mean, even like recently with like my anxiety has been peaking up lately, and I was telling you like. I don't know if it's like my nervous system got a little weirded out, like doing my first hunt and going through that whole thing. And then I was like, man, like my anxiety is like peaking for some reason. Like, where is this coming from? And now instead of like running from it or running from that feeling of like anxiousness, I'm like just witnessing it. Be like, huh, it's interesting that that's there. Mm-hmm. I wonder what I got to do with it. You mm-hmm. know? And so I was like, okay, maybe I need to move my body a little bit, you know? So I'll jump around and shake and do all these things. So try and like, just get the energy out of me. Yeah. And, or I'll do like a like a Wim Hof breathing session, you know? yeah. like something to like just move that energy through, and, uh, and it's better than taking a benzodiazepine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and 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 in that moment where we're able to be the witnesser, the one who's the one who can step offline and see it from the different perspective, like that's all it takes. It's that split second just to take that deep breath. Yep. Right. And how can I see this from a different perspective? Literally, like not only what and how can I move it, but what are the nuggets, right? What are the lessons? ¿Cuál es la lesión? Like that for me has been one of the biggest changes in my life when things are happening. And it's like, instead of like, fuck, it's happening again. Damn, I knew it was going to happen again. It's like, all right, let me take my breath like a big boy. What are the lessons? Because yep. I know there's got to be, I know that I'm setting all this up continuously to teach me and I'm still getting the same things that are happening, which means I'm not learning the lessons yet. So if I'm going to be the witness to myself, 
It's not my job to try to heal myself. It's not my job. Just listen. Just listen. And what are the lessons? And it's the same way that I come about with everybody else. And it's what I just want to piggyback on what you were saying and talking to the different people that'll be listening. As soon as you start to do some of your own work, as soon as you start to have a little bit deeper inhale and exhale, as soon as you stop having to feel like you have to look over your shoulder all the time and you can rest in self, other people are going to be attracted to that, that once we're in your similar vibration. And that's why you will be the one that they will be coming to. However, it is not your job to heal them. It's your job to heal, continue healing yourself. Be an example of what that looks like and just listen. And when we can do that for ourselves, just listen to what's happening inside of ourselves. Our body's having sensations to teach us, to communicate with us. Yep. Our mind is spinning and possibly going through different narratives and different storylines and different patterning and so on and so forth because it's it, like it's doing that to help us come with a different perspective. And are we allowing ourselves to really pick up on it? Because then we'll be able to pick up on it when others come in front of us too. And when they're talking and when we allow them to, because that's the safest space we could ever have. That's why the, that's why the boys go to the bar together, right? It's because yeah. usually there's a time in that time where somebody is just able to talk and somebody is just listening. It's yeah. not just talking over each other. Somebody's not trying to help you. Somebody's not, it's not our, it's not our job. Just listen. And then most of the time people will speak stuff that they've never allowed themselves to speak and spirit will spirit will help them also be able to heal themselves and you will just be the one that they will feel very safe around again you're the protector right right the protector comes in many ways not just the one willing to put their body in front of a bullet but how about just the one that's going to shut up and say hey man like this is your time yeah. right no judgment like whatever gets to come out, uh, you know, like if this is, if this is it and you're willing, I'm, you know, I'm willing to also be here with you. Yeah, it's heavy, man. What, um, what's the plan for you? Like, what are you, uh, the big, like, I guess a uh, picture for your life. Like, what are you seeing into the future? Like, where do you see yourself? Very simple, man. Like I said, I'm a family man. And at this point, there's there's been so much service in the way that I walk in life around the world that I'm setting up uh, connections and different plots of land, large, large, large plots of land with fresh running water, with food growing, people that are training, understanding how to work together, understanding how to uh, have babies come into this world in a, in a more productive way, understanding how to have different schooling. And if there is going to be programming, it's from a very healthy, aligned way to program about really what is and not what uh, the puppeteers are trying to get us to, to feel is true. Um, understanding how to work together in small, very tactical groups, understanding how to grow food, coming back to the basic nature of it all. So that way, as society continues to, to deteriorate, that we will have land, we'll have food, we'll have schooling, we'll have protection, we'll have a place that my children can go anywhere in the world. So I'm just like, nothing really changes for me at this point. I'm continuing just to make healthy relations, continue with healthy relations, um, where I feel will actually matter for the future. And that is for my family. And at this point, what I've dedicated is, it's not just my blood family, everyone is my family. Because that is what will that is still like, if I don't feel you're my family, there will be some way that I will manipulate. Right. And manipulation doesn't always have to be bad yeah. or from a negative perspective, manipulation could be anything, but it won't be coming straight from my heart. Yeah. It'll be coming from the mind because the way that I was programmed was you give your blood family, your heart, and you give everyone else the mind because your mind is for strategy, strategies for war. Right. they're going to be coming after you to try to manipulate you. So you got to be one step ahead of them. So that's as simple as, cause right, my programming started from bef like before, like at the very start of my memories. And so it's all I knew. So for me, if I'm going to no longer be a predator, it's as simple as everyone's my family and I have no enemies. Yeah. 
And as soon as I know I have no enemies, I don't look at you as different than me. If you're confused and fucking up and doing something that's way out of alignment, I once would have looked at you as an enemy. Now I look at you as a confused little puppy. Yeah. And with a confused puppy that grew into a big body, I'll know the way to appropriately come in and at times lead more effectively. So that way we can help the other one get to see all the nuggets in their life and why they lived the life they did and the patterns and the traumas that they had and unite. Yep. Who's like, do you, do you have an understanding of your base audience and like the lifestyle they lived or anything like that? Yeah, I think the the majority of some of the people that listen to the podcast are mm-hmm. probably veteran types, uh, people that probably had rough upbringings, people that, um, yeah, like in the um, kind of in the same. So this will touch in perfectly, probably for at least 100%. some of these. Yeah. Okay, so my my mission is to no longer see y'all as a bunch of predators, because if we're all being honest, we all have predator, we all have prey. We all have protector, all three with inside of us. If we can see each other as little puppies and have enough, uh, an, an, a, enough love inside of us, enough compassion inside of us to not just exterminate or not just put onto that side of the, the tracks or all of them just going into prison so we don't have to think that they breathe anymore. Like, no, man, people get out. Yeah. People get out of prison. And when they get out of prison, they're confused. And when they're confused, they do things that typically end up hurting themselves and others. People get out of war. When they come back home, they get confused. What do they typically do? They typically end up creating different acts that uh, make it more challenging for themselves and the people that are around them. So if we all are in a space of being a veteran to some type of war, to some type of upbringing that that wasn't roses and, and, and uh, unicorns, then at the very least, if we are going to fully unite, we get to put the guns down, all of the guns. And and I mean the internal guns. We get to put our shields down, but still close to us. Because we still get to stay ready. We get to stay ready so we don't have to get ready again. And that's why we get to train together. But we're not alone We're no longer willing to go after each other because of political stuff, because of different flags, because of uh, the financial elite, because of who should be getting vaccines and not getting vaccines. Like, no, if we are truly to unite, if we're going to make a change, we get to put all the guns down. We get to come to an understanding of where the predator is still rampant inside of ourself, do the healing that's necessary come together with the brothers and sisters that are willing to be able to witness in a healthy way and then understand why it was all so worth it and why you still have breath. Because every single action and inaction that you've taken in life was perfectly aligned to get us to where we are now and where we are now is in this conversation. Absolutely, man. So that's my burning desire. That's all of it. Let's, let's have, let's have a good life especially if we lived prior life where it's been more difficult on us to try to cope with typical society because we are not the fucking sheep. Yep. We are the sheep dogs. Yep. Like let's embrace each other in that. So that way, as the world continues in whichever way, like we're stronger. Yeah. It's interesting, man. This is the first time in, in my life um, where you know, in the past, you would see there was a, a huge divide between the military types, you know, that would, I would say, we'll call them right wing or you know, conservative types and the more of the uh, soulful, spirit driven, what you would call a hippie, right? So it's like, this is the one time in my life where like the hippies and the veterans are on the same team. Mm-hmm. Like we're uniting in large ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I like where, I mean, the conversation sucks when it comes to like, oh, the vaccine and all these other things, what are political bullshit. But because of that, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, and all the bad in that, there's some good in that because it's uniting a lot of people Absolutely. Uh, about body autonomy and about like, you know, you don't tell me what to do. You know what I mean? Like I'm a free man, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to witness. It's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Um, and I've been in both spaces, you know, and, and, uh, and I love it. I think yeah. it's great. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Well, hey, dude, I appreciate you so much for coming on this podcast, for sharing your truth, sharing your story and the way that you show show up in the world, man, is um it's appreciated. And I think that uh the best is yet to come, man. Like I I mean, I know that uh you know, I don't know if you want to put out where you're gonna be in the you know, in the in the country, but um I know where that is and I'm gonna come and see you. Hey. Um and I'm sure that we're gonna be uh we're gonna stay connected forever, man. Yeah, I feel that too, brother. Yeah. Thank you. I honor this. Thank you for taking the time away from your own family. We could be with anyone else doing anything else and you're choosing to do this. So that for me means that this is the most important thing in life right now. Absolutely. And I want to be able to show up in that way too and send only blessings to you and your continued path and knowing that we're aligned and we're united. Absolutely. And this will help other people know that they're not alone and to put to to put the flag up. If there is going to be a flag, it's the unity flag. And we're not in, not in unity just to sing Kumbaya, but we're in unity to train together still. Yep. and to sharpen each other still and yep. to hold each other accountable in, in an honest way. Absolutely, man. What's the best way for people to uh, to get in touch with you? If there's people that are seeking healing, seeking community, seeking unity, what's the way for people to connect with you? Best way for me, because I'm in the bush so much training with brothers and sisters and keeping all this alive would probably be the email. And that's I am bearheart at gmail.com. And then my website, I am bearheart.com. Or La Forza Sagrada, L A F O R Z A S A G R A D A dot com, La Forza Sagrada, the sacred force. Um, that sacred force is inside everything, inside of all of nature, inside of us, inside the elements. But it's it's an energy that gives to the ecosystem and doesn't take from the ecosystem. So with that being said, those are the ways that it's most easy to be able to get in contact with me. Perfect, man. Well, thank you again so much, brother. And looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Yeah, me too, bro. All right, brother. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.